And now it gives me great pleasure to go to to introduce our team of reproductive fish biologists, Christy Fors Forsgren, who took on the lead on um, our reproduction chapter. And um, and it's actually hey hey Christy, good Hi. to be here. Christy's just down the road from me here in California, and um, and help. It was this was an interesting chapter because we had reproductive studies going on in three different parts of the world. Um, Christy was looking at um, some some specimens that came here on the California coast, as well as um, Mediterranean, I think. Yeah, and then, in Italy. And then we had Richard McBride. Here, how hi, Rich. How's it going? Good to see you on the east coast. Yes, oh, I think you're on mute. I think you're on mute. Yeah, yep, I'm on. Yeah, nice to see you both. Yes, um, works for Noah and um, Rich, um, was, was um, shepherding the, the reproductive studies in the Atlantic. And um, and then we had Naka, um, to Toshiyuko Nakatsubo-san from Japan, Kamagawa, um, who had done his whole PhD on on um, the reproduction of, of molids off of Japan. And he yeah. unfortunately couldn't join us today, so I'm going to try and summarize a bit of his work. But um, so the chapter is really an amalgamation of of three different reproductive studies in three different parts of the world. And some really interesting discoveries. So, um, so I think I will just hand it over to Rich, and then you hand over to Christy. Christy, um, then we'll all just come back together. I'll talk a little bit about um, um, Toshiyuki Toshiyuki's work. Okay. And sounds good. Yeah, okay. So there we go. Here's the slide. Yeah. Um, yes, here, here's the full list of contributors on this section, the chapter of reproductive biology of ocean sunfishes. And this is a great picture from, from the chapter that uh, this is a world record mola. And uh, it shows you with the people in the, on, the, on the wharf there, you can really just see the enormity of the animal. And of course, there are larger fishes in the sea, larger whales, for example, larger sh uh, fishes such as whale shark or basking shark, but um, those animals often have very limited numbers of progeny, uh, live bearing animals. So it's not surprising that sunfish is in the literature as the most fecund, the animal, the marine vertebrate with the most numbers of eggs that the female produces. And we had a chance to really look at that uh, in this chapter. I think that was kind of a focal point, not just to necessarily count the exact number. Um, I'm gonna show you where the, the number comes from. If I, let's see if I can hit this. There we go. The number uh, of eggs, which was over 300 million eggs in an individual is from this paper by, by Johannes Smith. Uh, a Danish uh, explorer who was out there a hundred years ago, actually publishing this almost to the day a hundred years ago uh, about uh, all sorts of things, well, fascinating things. And this is now open access on the web if you're interested in uh, a nature paper. And the thing that's, uh, the, 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 the part about reproductive biology was limited to his expression here. He said, the sunfishes appear to be highly prolific in a specimen one and a half meters long, for instance, the ovary was found to contain no fewer than 100 mil, million small unripe ova. Well, not, not, not much on the methods in there. Uh, one of the things that concerned, that, that caught my eye was he, he seemed to be describing just counting a standing crop of unripe ova. Uh, this is essentially like mowing your grass once in the summer and weighing the, the grass and saying this is the bio, the productivity, when in fact that's really just a standing crop. You would actually have to mow, mow your lawn multiple times over the summer to understand the productivity of your lawn, your lawn versus your neighbor's lawn, that kind of thing. And so and we really got into this issue both to count the number of eggs in MOLA and, uh, and what we found it was, it was to, to explore more about the process we looked into it. 
And we found out that the, these among these small unripe ova, there's there's a batch that comes up, a smaller number of the batch, and it's produced. And presumably, although we don't know, presumably mole is a repeat spawner. So the eggs are produced on an annual basis or some cycle. Uh, when we did look into this, we found uh, in, in, a, in a specimen we had from New England, we found the 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 uh, the number of uh, of active ova that were going to be spawned was about 20 million. But there was another estimate from Japan that indicated it actually could be several hundred million. So I think why the count is is still um, is still in debate. Uh, we, we actually learned quite a bit about the process of how these eggs are produced in batches. And I think that's gonna really inform our ability to understand the resiliency of MOLA in terms of produ reproducing itself and perhaps re reproduction in, in aquarium settings. That's, that's, that's kind of the story I wanted to say about this. Um, and I will stop sharing my screen. If I can find the arrow and see if Christy is ready to speak next. Yeah, I'll go for it. Let me share my screen. Let's see. Well, we did this yesterday. <laughs> and there we go. So I wanted to share with you, um, you know, Rich kind of talked about fecundity, and I kind of wanted to share with you what I found were the most interesting aspects of the reproductive morphology of female mola. So I mostly got tissue samples from the cortex of the ovary to look at, and I performed um, the paraffin histology on them. But there was one mola tecta that washed ashore on the, off of the coast of Santa Barbara. And so I got that whole ovary, and it was really amazing to look at it because it was quite enormous. So the molas only develop one ovary, and this one ovary is a very large spherical structure. And this is really interesting. We do see that there are several animals and several vertebrates that produce only one ovary, but typically uh, it's very restricted in the number of eggs that they're producing. Usually we see this in viviparous animals. So here we have an animal that as a spawner has one ovary and just massive amounts of developing oocytes within it. So I've kind of made a label here for you and I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but the outside is the ovarian wall, sometimes called the tunica albagina or ovarian tunica. And this was a really thick, condensed fibrous tissue. And in a lot of animals, this thick tissue is the thickest when oocytes are in their developing phase. So as they become more mature, that wall thins a little bit. So this molotecta that we were able to salvage was 215 centimeters in total length. The ovary weighed uh, 1.43 kilograms. So that's a very large ovary. Um, the other night, the really interesting other morphological characteristic of this ovary is you can see the oviduct here. And so as what happens within the lumen of these ovaries, when the mature oocytes ovulate, they enter into the lumen, they would then go through this oviduct and be expelled into the external environment for the spawning and fertilization phase. And when we cut into this ovary, You'll notice you can see that thick ovarian wall here and the cortex with all of the developing ovarian tissue inside of it. And it was really packed in there very densely. Um, the ovarian wall made up the major composition of the weight of the, of the ovary and was about 82.5% of the total ovarian weight uh, of that 1.43 kilograms. So the weight of this ovarian wall was 1.18 kilograms. And I found that very interesting. With the mola, with the mola mola that we looked at that were from Italy and Portugal, these animals were all less than 90 centimeters in total length. And they did not have any maturing oocytes. They were all in the very early primary growth stage. The mola tecta, 
was just entering into the very early secondary growth phase of the early cortical alveolus stage. So this animal was stranded in February. And because we see those early oocytes starting to develop, if this animal had stayed in the ocean and gone on to live, it is quite possible that these oocytes would have matured and she would have spawned. Um, and since I'm talking about those mature oa, ova, I have one more slide I want to show you, and it is from our Japanese colleagues and their work. Um, they by far have done the most work with uh, the mola mola in Japan. But I just wanted to share with you what these mature ova look like. So they had an opportunity to study both wild and captive mola. And this is a migrating nucleus stage oocyte. This is maturing. And they had a female that was 100 centimeters in total length in captivity at SeaWorld Japan. And it spawned over a period of five days with 19 batches of these jelly-like gelatinous masses of eggs. And this is what the ova looks like. So quite interesting. Um, in the animals that they had studied, um, animals, females greater than 190 centimeters total length had mature oocytes. And uh, males are really rare and uncommon, and they investigated a male, 191 centimeters in total length, and they found these modal mature sperm within the testis. So those are kind of the highlights that I found most interesting, and um, I'll turn it back over to Tierney. Stop sharing. Yeah, yeah. No, I was gonna. I was. I'm gonna mention that rare release of eggs in captivity that um, that um, Toshiyuki writes about. Um, that and and the the sunfish did over over five days release, and they were all all those ova seemed at about the same um, stage of development. But um, in his work, he's certainly seen that. In, in a single ovary, there can be ova at different stages of development. So, and, and found that they do spawn at multiple times during the year, in the spring and um, in the fall. Um, and some of his highlights also were that the, the female gonads were most mature by August um, and then regressed um, by the end, by the end of August. And in males, they, um, they regressed by by December, so some differences there. Um, one thing, so so it's interesting when we think about um, the the study by by Schmidt that everyone everyone um, cites that the sunfish are the most fecund vertebrate, three hundred million. You know, I think um, maybe if we could bring Rich back on. And um, and Christy, we could talk about about that because I think it's a misunderstanding when people hear that that um, amazing superlative, they think, oh well, that must mean they're putting out three hundred viable <laughs> little hatchlings out into the world, but so much can happen within you know, like you say, a standing crop and a tresia you. That was a, in working with you, that was a new word I learned, um, that you're gonna have eggs die, ova die along the, along the way. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that, Rich? Yeah, I mean, you know, technically the 300 million could be an underestimate, it could be an overestimate. It could mm -hmm. certainly be an overestimate if, if those, all those oocytes don't develop completely. Some will die, some will go through, some can be reabsorbed. Some fishes reabsorb their ovary in times of stress for the nutrition. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them aren't gonna make it out that oviduct. Uh, right. Some of them won't be fertilized. So there's, it's a perilous path in terms of the differing, his count, Smith's count was like a, a potential number that's there at one time versus the realized fecundity that we may be actually interested in. Yeah. But it could also be an underestimate that if if there could have been still yolk eggs coming on online, you know, later on. So um, you know, it it's it, it's it's technically 
getting to the right number is it's just a number but it was fascinating to try to get to the right number demanded us to really learn about the process of that conveyor belt you know of oogenesis of the of the generation of the germ cells and how that's happening um and and it was really great to work with a team like this where we had insights from the wild and insights from captive animals i learned a lot yeah and um, I will mention one thing that absolutely blew my mind with this chapter and um, Toshiyuki's work was, um, so Schmidt, Schmidt, the his animal was, I think 1.2 meters. Is that right, Schmidt? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, 1. One, and a half, one and a half. One and, uh, one and a half, one and a half meters. And um, so um, Toshiyuki had one at 2.2 meters and, um, and opened it up and he did an estimate of how many ova were in a, that single ovary and came up with 847 million. So um, a radically larger number, of course, all, different at different sizes and different stages of development, but, um, but still a, a superlative there. I don't know of any other, do you know of any other vertebrate that's had a count like that of 847 little, Ova, no. all no. ovary. Now, now, as you say, we don't know if that's a, you know, highly likely that's not the realized output, but in a single vertebrate to have one ovary with 847 million ova. <laughs> that's yeah, it's, it's trying to hedge its bets and, and, yes. and do something for the future. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Putting them all out there. Now, granted, they're tiny little legs. They're just one millimeter in diameter. Um, right, which, which is a pretty common egg size for marine fishes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, only, only, only allows so much yolk, so much provisioning for the future generation as it goes out there. Uh, right. So you can only imagine that the, the mortality rate of those uh, eggs is pretty high, even if they are fertilized. It is it's pretty high. Not a lot of parental involvement either. They're broadcast spawners. So right. they're they're coming together, releasing the eggs, presumably over a period of time. They're fertilizing in the water column and then and then making their way. But you, it just leads you to believe there's got to be some, you know, when you think of um, whale sharks and snapper, you know, the whale yeah. sharks will hone in, find where those snappers are spawning, and then it is just Thanksgiving. And they're slurping everything up, and they know right where those snappers are going to spawn, and they make it a point to be there. You've got, uh, There's just got to be predators that yeah. follow around big molas and wait for that. Yeah, you, know. you, you got to figure that's why they have so many hundreds of millions that they're releasing, theoretically, is to satiate yeah. all those predators so that there's some offspring that have a chance to survive. Yeah, yeah, um, because they, anyway, they do, they can grow fast. Yeah. Um, and their larvae are these little porcupines. So, so when you swallow them, they're not going to be very um, easy to digest, at least right. if you're a small, a smaller fish. So, um, but um, but just a really really interesting work. I wish um I wish um Toshiyuki could have joined, but we do have um his work in in the book um with illustrations. Um, maybe we'll bring Jonathan back on because I know he might have um, I think he's in the and and might have some some um questions to add yeah. in there. Yeah, oh, sorry, I'll just move downstairs because I'm loud and I'm keeping family yeah. awake. Um, <clears throat> and you are in the UK right now, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on my fourth can of coke, so I'm keeping going. Um, <laughs> what was I going to say? Is there any is there a line that we can draw between what we've learned from the geography of these reproductive studies and what we know about the lava? Because it sounds there's evidence from you know this talk here that you know reproduction isn't, isn't just occurring in one place it's occurring everywhere so other places where we're finding where we should be finding larvae that we think that we just simply haven't so i guess the question could be condensed is why is there a disconnect between where we find larvae but evidence of sort of reproductively active individuals everywhere 
Yeah, I mean, that, that's, it's an interesting question because you do, you, you, you get these gravid females. Um, yeah. I mean, they, they, there are larval collections off of Japan, um, but putting those two together, where we're finding the most number of gravid adults and then where we find the larvae, that's, you know, that still has, <laughs> we have closed off. In our situation in New England, all our collections were from stranded individuals. Mm. And there's actually been a trend of increasing stranding over the years, which means we had pretty good numbers to pick from, but that doesn't speak well for, for the health of the population. Um, they get trapped in the bays and they can't get out. They get blown into uh, beaches or rock walls and things like that. So we have this very, um, narrow window to, to uh, examine them uh, September, late September, October, November, and, and it stops in December. Mm -hmm. So there was very limited what we could do, even for seasonality uh, um, in terms of, and let alone, you know, where they're positioning themselves to spawn and, and how they're dispersing their eggs and larvae. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's just one piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. You ever had Best some in some so, uh, apologies if I missed it from our part of the world, some sort of UK Ireland. Have you had anything from around this neck of the woods? No, I was just taking advantage. I, I was the re I had some reproductive biology, and uh, Carol Car uh, Carson Krill Carson uh, has a a stranding program. There's actually a number of animals that strand torpedo rays, a yeah. sunfish that strand that really get kind of caught on Cape Cod. Cape Cod uh, sticks out in Massachusetts and it's a, a no fa known faunal break. So the Gulf of Maine, north of it is very cold and south of it, it's very warm uh, along the middle, uh, middle states of the US. And so a lot of animals, if they can't get around Cape Cod, um, they don't make it, they get washed up on the beaches. So we were just taking advantage of this opportunistic. Yeah, because I'm gonna say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look into that because I know in the in the UK there's sort of a marine strandings network and, and megafauna um, typically get, not all obviously, but you know, case studies get taken to the Zoological Society in London and you can put in like a Sweeney Todd kind of macabre kind of order list of like things that you'd like to collect. I'm going to look into the fact that see if there are any stranded stuff, if we could, if there's any tissue or just, yeah, get an idea of exactly what you need. And then we could try and collect some more stuff from you from here. Sure. That could be cool. Yeah. But I, I love that larval stage because it's so crazy. I, I teach a little bit of that. And there's a, a classic old thing. I probably got it wrong, but I always teach it is the, Riker Forster thesis and it blows me away like with cod it's like if larval mortality is 99.9999 which it can be you've only got to shift that and you get 100 cod from that out of 100 yes. million eggs if you shift it by one thousandth of one percent you get 200 cod it's just such an incredible game isn't it down at that end of the the life history the one thousandth of one percent could double your adult stock that come out of that. It's just impossible to calculate. Yeah, it certainly humbles the fishery scientists that are trying to predict the recruitment in right. the next year or two. Yeah, yeah, for real, definitely. Yeah, 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 it's, it's an impossible task. Yeah. And, and the same with fecundity. Fecundity could not just be simply size dependent. We talk about this mm -hmm. size fish has this many eggs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fact, it could depend on how well they feed. It could depend on their experience. It could depend on a number of things that we're not controlling for. Um, so there's there's many more questions uh, to ask. Yeah, which have probably got a lag of a year or so, how an animal fed over the entire previous year. Yeah, that's so hard to quantify. <laughs> right. And, and I mean, we, it talks about that in the chapter, you know, the, ti the timing of development depends on the location. So and the release. So environmental factors play a large part. 
Yeah, and you could even yeah, you could even have an individual where you have a female, maybe she's in a good feeding ground early on in the reproductive season, so she has a lot of resources. You could have a large number of oocytes that are starting to mature. If something happens in that environment where she loses her food resource, you could start to see that atresia occurring within the ovary. So mm -hmm. now you've seen this major reduction just because of a change in, you know, food availability or the habitat. Right. Right. Well, they still are uh, superlative, aren't they? <laughs> and how, how amazing to have a tecta ovary to boot. You know, that was way. fantastic. I was so excited to get that. We were trying to figure out the logistics of it. And I was like, I have a FedEx number. Just send it. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, there was another another tecta that um, washed up in um, in San Francisco that was uh, Unfortunately, it, it was putrefied inside by the time um, by the time we got to it. But um, but yeah, so these are so it's so opportunistic, and I can't um, I can't underscore enough how critical it is, and like what Krill Carson does with her stranding network, um, you know, to making these uh, strandings available and alerting the right people, I naturalist. Um, all the groups that are doing this, we can make use and make discoveries with those with those strandings and those sightings. And it timing is of the essence because the fresher we can get them, the better off, the better our discoveries. So, um, big shout out to to Krill and the important work she does there. Yeah. Well, um, so as we'll we'll find more tissues and send them your way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll get on the coast here for you. See what we can do. Yeah, yeah. We have many part other parts of the world to add into these studies. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to cast a wide net with um, Mola. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Well, thank, you for this thank you for this opportunity to speak to the group. I, I, I really enjoyed working with Emily Tholke and Krill on this, and and joining you as a, a collaboration. Yes. Well, thank you for being part of the book. I mean, it was it was um, it was great to be able to put it all all the pieces together. So, so I'm really, really grateful to you guys.